Thank you very much, Tracy. And hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and present this project um, with this emphasis on methods. And I'm, I'm really excited to, and looking forward to the discussion at the end of the talk. So this project is one that I've been involved in for several years since I started at Quest. Um, and it's involved a lot of different steps and components and also contributions from people both at Quest and beyond. And the overall aim was to support institutions in Germany, specifically university medical centers, to um, implement responsible research practices and specifically improve the transparency of the clinical trials they're conducting. And so maybe a very short disclaimer. So a, a lot of these, a lot of the approaches I'm going to touch on in the presentation uh, relate to data science. And so, of course, I've dabbled in data science over the last few years. But that being said, I'm very much presenting this from the perspective of a meta researcher. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a fully fledged data scientist or software engineer, but I'm going to try and draw out some generalizable principles um, that you could maybe use uh, in similar projects, um, if that's your interest. So just keep that in mind as we go through the talk. Um, so just to contextualize this project. So the background uh, of this, as I said, was to try and support university medical centers in Germany to improve the transparency of the clinical trials they were conducting. And for that, we had three different steps. In the first step, we first wanted to just get a sense of what the status quo was relating to transparency of clinical trials. So we um, ran a few approaches to evaluate the status quo of transparency at university medical centers. And then we moved on to the second step, uh, which is the focus of my talk today, where we piloted different communication and change strategies. So here, essentially, we were taking that data that we got in the first step, but then communicating it to the relevant uh, target audience um, at different levels. So we recognize that you know, institutions um, you know, benefit from being informed from this, um, but also individual researchers who eventually change practices on a day-to-day -day basis in, in their work um, are also a very important group to target. And then thirdly, and this is where we're most active now, is to support long-term implementation and systemic change. So again, take what we've learned in the first two steps and use that to, to, to drive improvement. So this is the paper that I'm talking about today. Uh, this was published earlier, so last year now, and, and this is also the dashboard, uh, that, a sneak peek of the dashboard that you can, that's also linked in the paper. So of course, feel, feel free to, um, to browse these during the talk um, and also after, I've just put all the links there. So to start with, why communicate institutional performance in a dashboard? So increasingly funders are demanding you know or encouraging the the uptake of responsible research practices or open science practices this is much becoming much more common um but in order for institutions to to take action it's really important that they first have a good understanding of what the current uptake of these research practices are so a big goal of our research was and our project was awareness so essentially to inform institutions of how they're currently doing so they can really implement change. So a big advantage of a dashboard is that it very quickly shows where there's room for improvement and what to prioritize and where to allocate resources. And that can be very helpful um, for priority setting, you know, and when you're building a strategy at the level of an institution. A dashboard also offers an ongoing source of interactive and actionable data. And so these two last bullet points really essentially boil down to practical support for institutions to change. Um, besides showing current performance, a dashboard typically also shows how, um, how, ch how practices change over time. And that's really nice because if you think you wanna change um, the uptake of a particular practice and you come up with an intervention uh, to try and change things, you can really see whether that intervention has been successful and whether it's had an impact because you can see the change over time. And finally, I think a dashboard, particularly if it's publicly available, is really quite powerful, not only in informing the relevant stakeholders, but also more generally mobilizing public opinion. 
So putting also, so making this data more open and more accessible uh, also to the general public. Um, and in some cases that can also be very effective in, in driving change. So I was reflecting about our project and also other monitors and dashboards that are out there that relate to responsible research. And I think that the approaches that you use and the practices that you focus on really, of course, very much depend on what your objective is, right? So it could be that you're, you're, you want to monitor adherence to your institutional's policies, uh, but it also could be that you, you want to restrict yourself to compliance with laws if you're in a working in a field which has, has really formalized best practices. Um, or you could take a broader approach and look at adherence with ethical requirements and or guidelines. Um, uh, I know also another monitor that, that focuses on monitoring progress on a national strategy, uh, where the practices they come have been embedded within that strategy. And then finally, you might just simply want to monitor practices that are valued in a community. And so these are all really legitimate approaches uh, or, 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 or things to focus on, but they do mean that um, that will heavily influence the um, the practices that you focus on and the approaches that you use. So that's just something that uh, to to keep in mind. And of course, feasibility always comes into play. Um, this will always um, come in and 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 bug you at one point and set a a, a constraint eventually on what can be done. Um, but but I think having feasibility as a starting goal does is is not necessarily helpful because I think it's always important to have a clear narrative um, for why you're choosing specific practices to to monitor and to communicate. So back to our study. So our objective was to assess and communicate transparency practices of clinical trials conducted at German university medical centers. And so by transparency practices, I specifically mean, um, best practices for transparency in clinical trial registration and reporting. So for drug trials, there are laws for registration and reporting, but our interest was broader. And so we didn't want to just focus on drug trials, but also other clinical trials. And there are um, ethical requirements, such as the Declaration of Helsinki, that, um, that, that you know, really require the registration of, of trials um, and also outline ethical responsibilities uh, for results reporting. There are also guidelines, for example, the WHO guidelines for results reporting, which specify specific timelines for reporting results from clinical trials. And then there's also other, um, other groups that have endorsed or, or taken up these recommendations as well, or formalized them uh, as requirements such as funding, uh, such as funders. So this was our interest. And translating this into specific practices, so these are the ones that we focused on in our study. So uh, you'll see free practice on the left now that all relate to the registration of clinical trials. So the first is prospective registration. So that means was the trial registered in a registry before the start of, of enrollment of patients? Then secondly, the timely summary results reports in registration. So essentially, if you're doing clinical trial and you'll, you'll have registered your clinical trial in a registry and um, there's a best practice to report summary results in that registry after a certain time after completion. And then finally, we looked at whether the publication, any results publications from that trial were linked in the registration. So we also looked at three additional practices that rather relate to publication. So um, in addition to reporting results in a registry, um, clinical trial investigators are also expected to report their results in a journal publication and also within a timely manner from completion. And the WHO additionally recommends uh, that the any publication is open access where available or where possible. And lastly, the publication um, should also include the, the trial registration number. So this is really important for findability. Um, so linking the registrations with the publications so that, um, so, so that someone interested in the trial can easily access uh, different components of that trial. So these were our practices. And now I'm gonna break down our, our general approach into three main phases. The first was fetching the data that we needed to assess these practices. 
The second is processing the data that we got to construct or to, to assess the practices. And then thirdly, visualizing the data. So I'm going to start with fetching the data. Um, so typically, if you're starting a project like this, so you know, you've decided on you know, general narrative of why you want to do this, and you've outlined some specific practices that you're interested in. Um, now, the next step is to find data sources that you can use to essentially answer the questions that you want to answer. Um, so there are many data sources out there ranging from clinical trial registries to other more general registries to bibliographic databases and, and other databases. And I just put some examples here. This is by no way a comprehensive list, um, but it's just it's really worth putting in some efforts and some time and looking at or searching which databases are out there and which may be more, most appropriate to answer your research question. And some of these databases or data sources, I should say, are gonna be openly available and others are proprietary, uh, meaning that you need to you know, pay a certain amount to, to, to access that, or you might have an institutional subscription to, um, to one of these platforms. Now, whether to use proprietary databases is entirely up to you and, and, the, and, and, the, and the objectives and, of your project. Um, there are considerations here. It could, it could be that a proprietary database really just has exactly the data that you need, and then you may not have the option, but you could also just you know, say flat out, well, look, I want to use openly available data databases and, and that's it. So I think the choice is really um, very context specific, but it's definitely something to keep in mind when thinking about you know, others potentially reusing your, your approach um, or, or just scaling your approach as well. So once you've found a couple of data sources that look interesting and that may have the data that you need, um, it's important to start thinking about how you're going to get that data from these different data sources. And often there are different ways to do that. Um, and you may well be ending up with different data sources and a different approach for each. So I want to quickly run through some of the main approaches that we use to extract data automatically from some of these data sources. So the first is an application programming interface or API. So APIs are basically a way for um, two computer systems to communicate with one another. Um, and so essentially it's, it's one of the best and, and perhaps even easiest ways to get to data that is in a database. And, that, and doing so will return the data in a structured way um, that is also easy for you to use in, in your pipeline moving forwards. And APIs are also specifically designed to handle a high volume of requests and to be queried repeatedly. Um, and they also make it easier to update your, your data. Let's say you, you extract your data and then one year later you want to get updated data from the same data source. You can just rerun your code and get updated data. So that's really nice. Um, and you can see in this schematic, it's like a nice little analogy, I think, that really helps understand how it works. I mean, of course, it's a bit simplified, but the idea is that you you as a user build an API request and you send that and then and the API serves as an intermediary person essentially that sends your request to the database and then and then send, like uh, sends the response back to you in a structured way. So um, this is just an example of an API response, what you might get. So this is actually from the unpaywall API. Um, and so you'll get the data structured in this way. And then of course, you, you, you need a bit of programming experience to construct an API request, but also um, then use the, the response that's coming from it. Um, another approach is to download the data. Now, some databases uh, or platforms offer you to, to download and install a, a data, like a basically a copy of the entire database onto your server. Uh, and that can be really nice, but again, this very much depends on your on your use case. And um, the issue here is that you can quickly run into storage issues if you're if you're using this locally. So, um, and I think this also requires some technical expertise. So, so this this is a definitely an option, but it really might just be relevant for specific use cases. And besides that, 
There's typically also an option to, to do a bulk download. So that means um, downloading so a set of, of records, uh, not maybe the full set, but just enough that you can do some testing with. So this is often something that is quite nice to do when you're piloting things and you want to test things with more, more than one, but, but just not the full set. But again, when it comes to constructing your full data set, you might need to um, find a way to do repeated requests and then merge the data. So that's just something to consider. And then if um, automated or, or if there's not really good programmatic access and, and downloading is not an option, you might also consider web scraping. So web scraping essentially is just downloading and extracting data from a website. Um, and you can construct a tool that does that for you automatically. Now, um, this can be like useful, but it's also got some caveats. Um, the first being that if there's any update or change to the website, um, you know, you can entirely lose the functionality of, of your web scraper very quickly. And so this is of course quite volatile and, 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 and not ideal. And then of course, it's just technically quite difficult because websites are very different, come in different flavors. And so um, scrapers often have different functionalities and features. But essentially, you can then access a web page and then find the data that you're interested in, download it, and restructure it in a format that's good for you. And then finally, manually, which can often be the easy course of action in the beginning and the simplest thing to do. But of course, as we all know, it can often uh, come to get us in the end because let's say you just extract a bunch of data manually, but then something changes in, in the way, um, you know, let's say you want to extract a new variable, then you have to rerun everything again. And that can be quite painful. So back to the study, what were we aiming to measure? So I gave you an outline of the different practices that we have. And um, so which data sources did we need for this? Well, I already kind of gave a hint by color coding some of the words. So on the left, you see in blue, the word registration is hinted at. So of course, clinical trial registries were an important source for us um, to get to registration data. And for the publication data, of course, bibliographic databases were really crucial. So these are our two um, main data sources in the project. Now, focusing on clinical trial registries, so we had these three main um, sources. Um, you can see two have solid arrows. That's because these were our primary uh, sources for clinical trial data, which we accessed via um, a variety of methods, so downloads, APIs, and also a scraper. And then we were also interested in data from the EU Clinical Trial Register, um, but because we had collaborators who had a lot of this data already, we uh, basically um, we we collaborated with them, and 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 they kindly shared that data with us. So this was uh, the way in which we received this data. So these were our main sources for clinical trial data. And then our hope really was, you know, ideally in an ideal world, you'd have a clinical trial registry entry. And among the information in that entry, you would have the publications that, is, that are associated with the trial. And in some cases, yes, you do have that. But we found that in many cases, um, if you scanned a, a, a clinical trial registry entry and you looked under publications, well, you would see, well, no publications available. And so this made it very difficult to find publications that were associated to the clinical trials in our, in our data set. And so that because uh, there was limited linkage here, we had to actually resort to a manual approach to find results publications of the trials in our, in our data set. And so you can see a flow chart on the left, so don't worry about reading the contents of it. But so essentially what I want to convey is that while this was not a systematic search because we weren't looking for all the results publications associated to a trial, we were just actually looking for the, the earliest publication that we could find, um, we did use a systematic approach to find these publications. And so this was also pre-registered um, in OSF. And it was a really discrete number of, of, of steps whereby um, coders had to search different data sources. So starting with the registry for results publications, and then depending on whether they found um, a publication, they moved on to, to different data sources like PubMed and Google Scholar, and then used um, 
or search for the trial identifier or a different combination of terms relating to the trial. So this was quite a time consuming approach, as you can imagine. Um, but this was also very important because we really needed a validated set of trials and associated publications. Um, and then we enriched that publication data by doing automated queries uh, to different bibliometric uh, databases, for example, PubMed, to get bibliometric information and the publication abstract, but also on paywall to get the open access status of publications, and also, for example, share your paper to get publisher self-archiving permissions. Um, and finally, we used a combination of manual and automated approaches to go from having the publication DOIs to having the publication full text as PDF, which we needed for one of the practices. So when fetching the data, what to consider? So you need to consider whether you wanna use open source and or proprietary data. Again, that's very context specific. You may need to use different approaches to fetch data from different sources. And again, some of these approaches will, or tools will already exist and that you can just use them, but you may also have to develop your own approaches to fetch the, the, the data that you need. It's also important to consider whether and when you need to get updated data. And again, that will also inform which method you'll use to fetch the data. Because for example, as I said before, if you really just want to get data once and, and not again, I mean, maybe even a manual approach is good, but if you need to get regular updates, then um, for example, an API would be really, really appropriate. And then importantly, store query dates so that you can also communicate when you obtain data from a specific source. Um, so I've already touched on the last, the next point about the tools um, to fetch the data may already exist, or you may need to de develop them. Um, one point is also to respect limits for API calls and to web scrape responsibly. So often there are terms and conditions, for example, for web scraping, or there are limits for uh, the number of requests you can make for API calls. And it's just important to respect those. Otherwise, um, it's just, you know, creating like you, you could be taking like bandwidth from the host and, and this is just all considerations to, to keep in mind. And finally, caching the raw data by which I mean just storing the data in a temporary location when you're in the initial phases of your project can be very helpful, especially when you're testing. So you don't want to just keep downloading the data when you're testing things. It's nice to just have a local copy that you can draw on um, in the initial phases. Then moving on to data processing. So we now have the data that we need from these different sources. And we our next step was to assess the, the transparency practices of interest. Now I'm not gonna go through all of them. I just wanna highlight two examples, um, which are in my opinion, at least on the on opposite scales of the of difficulty. So prospective registration was relatively straightforward. Um, but then uh, on the right, trial getting like finding whether the publications included the trial registration number actually re re required quite a few more steps and was a bit more complicated. So I'll just highlight those briefly now. So for prospective registration, so you know we started with this registry data that we downloaded, and then we essentially getting down getting to prospective registration is just computing. Um, the variable based on two dates, right? We have a registration date and a start date in the registry. And prospective registration is whether it's registered before enrollment of the first patient. And so all we had to do is check whether the registration date was before the start date. Uh, so it's really just a comparison of two variables. And it sounds easy enough, but uh, just want to highlight an example. So something we came across is um, that the dates were not always stored in a format that we expected. So here you can see um, a registry entry for a trial and you can see the registration date is 24th of January, 2006, um, all, all good. But then you look uh, a little bit lower down and you can see the study start date is just January, 2006. So immediately you can see the dates are not formatted in the same way. And of course, this is now tricky because you know you wanted to do an exact comparison um, based on these dates. 
but um, now they're formatted differently. And so that actually meant that we had to go and revisit our definition of this practice in our project um, to consider prospective registration as whether um, the trial was registered within the same month or a prior month to start date. So just a, a nice example of how the data quality can influence how you operalize, operationalize a practice. And then moving on to the other example. So here again, we wanted to search the publications that we had for trial registration numbers. And for this actually, uh, so someone in our team at Myers and Holtz Hill had to develop a R package that detects trial registration numbers from all WHO primary registries using regular expressions. Uh, so this in itself was already a lot of, of work. Um, and then she used, uh, we used this R package on the publications that we had extracted to try and find if there was a trial registration number. So here you can see just a little schematic of this. So we had publication metadata and the publication abstract. And here we just ran the tool and we could find, for example, a trial registration number in the metadata. But for, we also had to do this in the publication full text but we only had the PDF. And so for this, we had to do an additional step of converting a um, PDF, which is not really machine readable to, um, to, to a machine readable format. So this was yet another step that we had to do. And then only then could we use our tool and search for the identifiers. So as you see, a bit more of a convoluted process. And then the final step was bringing together all this data into a clinical trial transparency data set. And here, just want to highlight one thing, which is that it can be tricky when you have the same type of data, for example, registry data, but from different sources, like clinicaltrials.gov and DRKS, because of course, they might show the same data, but just in slightly different ways. And then you need to make decisions as to how you harmonize that data uh, or whether you harmonize it. So then in terms of quality assurance, um, just want to flag three things. So it's important throughout this process to, um, to validate the data that you have. So you might get automated data with tools, but it's often you often need to use manual steps to then go into the data, data in more detail and either extract additional components or, or just validate what the tools have returned. In the same line, um, if you're using tools or developing tools on the project, it's really nice to assess the performance of these tools and then also sh share that performance with, with others so that they can take this on board when using it in their own project. And then finally, testing the code is always really important in making sure that you know, you're, 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 you're getting what you expect. And so you can just build assertions and check if those assertions are true. And that's always a great way of checking the logic of your code and also um, whether and just resolve unexpected bugs. So just to wrap up, what to consider. So again, the tools to fetch the data, um, or to, sorry, to process the data may already exist, but you may also need to develop them. Um, how do you operationalize, operationalize practices and how is this influenced by the data quality? Then it's good to carefully consider how to harmonize information from different data sources. Um, if you are using manual steps, it's good to keep track and document them. Um, not that, you know, all your automated approaches are well documented, but, but any manual changes that you made have been lost along the way. Um, if applicable, evaluate and share the performance data of tools used and then create a code book, which explains how each variable was defined and computed for other people um, wanting to uh, use similar approaches. Some strengths and limitations. So for this, I think our scope did extend beyond legally required practices. And I think that was good um, uh, because it also explored transparencies that were beyond uh, just you know, results reporting, but also about the, the accessibility of results and their findability. Um, it, there's, um, with our project, like we built it such that it's scalable. So it's based on publicly available data sources and automated methods for the most part. Um, and we also have open data and methods so that can be reused and adapted. Now, our main limitation is the quality of the data sources that in that we're completely dependent on registry data being accurate. Um, but in reality, that may not be the case. And that's something that we really have to be aware of. 
When it comes to data processing, there are specific limitations linked to each pra practice. The main one being that not all practices um, or for each practice, you have specific requirements. And so, for example, you might only have to you have to limit the analysis to only publications for which you have the full text or, or things like that. So just things to consider. And that's also hard to communicate. And then finally, because we have manual steps, um, it, it's not fully it's not possible to fully update um, all components of the dashboard. Now, the third point, which I um, I realize I'm getting to the end of the talk, but of course I want to touch on is um, visualization. So this is then what it all ended up. Um, this was the final output of us, our study. So here you can see as a, a screenshot of the main page of the dashboard where you see this performance um, across uh, university medical centers. Now the dashboard was developed in R Shiny, which is an open source R package to build interactive web applications from R. And all the code is openly available in GitHub. It was hosted on a Charité server and it's now publicly available. But we did restrict access um, actually to the dashboard while we were developing it. Now there are different types of visualizations. Um, so in the main page, we show the performance of, of uh, on transparency across all university medical centers. Um, so here you can just see an example for summary results reporting in the European Clinical Trial Register. And then another visualization that we had um, for to help universities contextualize their performance to others was um, this view here, where you can see the performance of one university medical center contextualized to that across all university medical centers. Um, we also felt like it was important to give uh, an overview of the, the like the to justify the practices that we included, and for that we included a, a, an infographic with an overview of the practices and the main um, expectations from ethical requirements or guidelines, and then we also gave the sources um, for people wanting to find out more. So this was really just an an attempt of putting everything in one place. Um, uh, uh, regarding like the, the transparency practices included. And then we, of course, heavily built on interactive features, um, which is a major strength of the dashboard. And that included uh, um, mouse overs of the, the methods next to each plot. Uh, so, so that people could really read this quite quickly. And then also uh, limitations for each practice. So that was really not just not just on a separate page in the methods, but directly in the plot while people, so for people to consult while they were interpreting the graph. Then we also had drop down menus, of course, as you see in many dashboards. And here I think it's nice because you can see the same plot, but just uh, for different registries. And you can see immediately the drastic difference between these. And so again, emphasizing the, 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 the kind of, that the dashboard is really a powerful tool for communicating this type of data. And then finally, we also had um, uh, mouse overs showing the, the, in each case, the numerator and the denominator for each practice so that people didn't just get proportions, but they could also look directly into the number of um, publications or trials involved. We also had an FAQ and the data set available um, directly from the dashboard to give a bit more context. And I think I just want to finish on a few lessons learned um, in the when for the visualization. So we um, didn't actually do this in our project, but I think it's really worthwhile considering doing A, B or usability testing on a dashboard prototype, um, because that can really inform you of, of just what not to do and what to do and, and how it's gonna be interpreted by people. Then use colorblind friendly colors. Of course, that's very important for accessibility. Um, make full use of the interactive features since this is really a strength of the dashboard um, and then prepare data export in an accessible way and consider your audience. We were already approached by people um, who wanted to, to get the data for their own institution. I think it's really worthwhile preparing that in advance um, so that you're ready to go. And then carefully consider whether and how to display performance across institutions. I think there's again very many ways of going about this. Um, and I think that's also something that you can get from the usability testing. So it's really worthwhile. 
And then finally ensure that you have a good understanding of the data and its limitations. Because as you can see, this project really drew on different approaches and skill sets. But I think it's really important when choosing how to visualize the data that you clearly understand what the limitations are and what to consider when showing that data. So as you know, we wrote a paper that summarized the um, how we how we built this dashboard. Um, but we've we wanted, of course, we wanted to like get this into the hand of the community. And also um, we felt that this was really a good way of triggering discussion. This was one of the main goals that we had, not only to inform institutions of how they were doing, but also just use this as a conversation starter to also involve people who, you know, are, are who can change things into the discussion and possibly connect them as well. So we thought carefully of our dissemination strategy. Typically, we would have done a preprint. In this case, we actually decided not to, simply because it also had institutional data. And we felt like, um, in this case, we felt more comfortable with just uh, making it publicly available after peer review. I think that's, again, a decision that's completely dependent on specific to the project and the group. Um, so in this case, we actually actively sought out media attention. We had some support in that process, but a lesson learned from me is that this is very much an active process. Um, so you have to really reach out to, to journalists um, or intermediaries. Um, and, and here speed is key. So if you do get attention from a journalist, then um, it's really important to get to them very quickly. Um, I found it helpful to prepare two or three core messages to convey in their accessible language so that you feel more prepared when you're engaging with journalists. Um, and also, as I said before, um, be prepared to share the data in an accessible way with interested parties because those requests are going to come and it's just nice to share that data really quickly. Um, and in our case, so we actually got some interest from the press and this was um, very nice and rewarding, but also terrifying um, from a perspective, personal perspective, but also overall a very, very, um, uh, yeah, a very nice experience. And with that, um, I think I will conclude and thank you for your attention.